teman-teman. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sharifa Harrigan. I am the currently the events planning chair of the Black Student Union, and I also work here at Salt Lake Community College. I'd just like to say welcome to everyone in the room and those participating um, via Zoom. Thank you for being here. I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce our panelists, and then um, I'll let them take over from there. So speaking with us today, we have Gina Alfred, which is, who is a staff association president. We have Dr. Cindy O. Ferreros of the Department of Psychology. We have David Robles, who is also in the Department of Criminal Justice. And then we have Emily Thompson, who is in the Center for E-Learning. Then we have Dr. Anthony Nocella, who is also in the Department of Criminal Justice. Um, welcome and thank you all for being here today. So before we get started, um, I'd just also like to uh, talk about the Black Student Union. So we meet every Thursday from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock p.m. Um, we usually meet upstairs in the Student Center uh, in room 221-223. Um, the meetings that we have, they vary from day to day. Usually we talk about uh, serious topics that are going on within the Black African American community. Um, sometimes we might have a movie day, um, but we just want to let you all know if you're interested in joining, um, you can see Miss Glory or any one of us like Ms. Beringo who's outside doing the um, sign in or myself um, that can help you get signed up and become a member if you're interested. So thank you all for being here today and I'll let you all go ahead and get started. So uh, this is a collaboration, uh, and at the same time, it's a, an event that's going to be national recorded, et cetera, uh, which is wonderful, uh, things that we've learned through technology. And so I'm just going to go through the outline, and then each of us are going to, in a collaborative, uh, supportive method, uh, take on a few of the different uh, points of this outline and workshop. We're going to have an introduction. What is critical race theory? Anti-critical race theory 101. The bills against critical race theory. Talking about direct action, community organizing, and activism. And then we'll have a Q&A, comments, uh, and then we might have an action, which uh, Black Student Union uh, will be discussing at the end. So thank you again so much for everyone coming. Uh, so we, we just kind of discussed the PowerPoint and then the presenters. And uh, I'll let you all read online as well as in person, just a little bit about all the presenters, including myself. Awesome. So uh, Emily or I can take this, uh, but you want me to, okay. This is a conversation, so uh, feel free and in an educational spot of higher education. So we're all about learning and not being dogmatic and uh, sharing our knowledge that we have through our experiential uh, lives that we live as well as our intellectual lives. So please be respectful of oneself, others in the space, virtually or in person. We welcome your input and questions and thoughts and uh, feedback. Ensure your comments and or questions are clear as best as possible. Discussions should be approached in good faith or goodwill. Attack the idea, not the person, right? So let us begin. So I, this is uh, my point, and then I'll be passing it on to two of my outstanding uh, colleagues. So uh, critical race theory, grounded in critical theory from the Frankfurt School in Frankfurt, Germany, um, after the social research uh, school was developed, uh, was to challenge eugenics and other oppressive theories. So a lot of people think that critical thinking is about asking questions. It's asking larger social problems and, and examining socioeconomic and political issues. Uh, critical thinking is the action of critical theory, which is centered on challenging hegemony, uh, domination, and authoritarianism, which was founded, the concept of hegemony came from uh, a, a scholar uh, named Antonio Gramsci. So here in this slide, we see images of eugenics in the 1930s and early uh, and 1800s of why eugenics uh, was used. It's a science that is not used today, hopefully, by most people. And it was to minimize, oppress, 
uh, and stigmatize women, people of the LGBTQQTI uh, community, as well as uh, BIPOC community, right? So the idea was that people that are women or LGBTQQ or people of color have smaller brains. And you can do this by measuring people's nose, forehead, uh, and then the pencil test or the brown bag test, right? And this was all part of eugenic science. So we, if you wanna know more about that, we can ask questions and comments later. Uh, and as, as this uh, workshop keeps on going. So without any further ado, I'll pass it on to uh, Cindy as well as David. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. And thanks to the BSU for letting us crash your weekly meeting. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Cindy Fierros. I teach psychology and ethnic studies here. Um, I find this a very full circle moment um, because 11 years ago, I moved from California to Utah to study critical race theory in education. Um, so it's a very full circle moment for me. Um, I used critical race theory in my analysis as a master's student at Cal State Northridge. I was really interested in the educational experiences of Latinx youth in California. And then um, again, using critical race theory in my dissertation, where I was analyzing the spiritual activism of Chicana professors also in California. So it's, it's really a full circle moment, interesting for me to be here not just discussing critical race theory, but discussing it in terms of having to, to defend um, its validity as, as a theory. So I wanna just chat a little bit about the, the origins of critical race theory, because I think it um, originates in a very important um, historical moment um, and social moment as well. Um, you'll see in the slide here, it was really founded and grounded within the personal experiences, the educational experiences, um, the academic and, and, um, and, and professional experiences of law professors, students, scholars, and activists. So you had a group of students, Derek Bell um, was a law professor in the 70s, um, had written a book on, on racial realism um, and was a professor of law um, at, at this time. And at the same time you had, so I'm gonna mention some names that, that are kind of founders of critical race theory, originators of critical race theory and names that you might've heard. Um, at the same time, you have Kimberly Crenshaw, the godmama of intersectionality and critical race theory, entering law school, um, excited for um, what is to come, um, excited to be able to be a young black law student talking about um, race in the law. Um, and so what happened is you have these students entering school, having been young children or young adults during the 60s, excited about the possibilities of what the civil rights movement um, and societal changes would allow for them to do as law students and, and um, future lawyers in terms of practicing or educating. And you have them being quite disappointed not necessarily in the civil rights movement, but in um, what institutions did or did not allow for the civil rights movement to actually do um, in, in institutions. And specifically, they were really interested in looking at law. And one of the major critiques and realizations of many of the um, educators and students of this time was that they were coming into to law um, and realizing that this objectivity objectivity or neutrality of the law, this idea that we can use the law as a very neutral way to um, process people's experiences was actually not very neutral at all, that there were a lot of race differences, um, which really highlighted the fact that racism was not just about the way people thought about other people. Um, racism was not just something that was enacted on an individual level, but racism was really something that was enacted at the institutional level. And again, these individuals were really interested in the way that it was that race and racism were incorporated into the legal apparatus of the society. So through law, through the courts, um, et cetera. Um, so early critical race intellectual thought 
um, was grounded on the fact that the law was not in fact neutral or objective. Um, that in fact, there was racism hidden under this idea of objectivity um, and that racism permeated the law and other institutions. And so later critical race theory scholars, um, particularly in the field of education, enacted those same ideologies and, and wanted to use critical race theory as a lens to unpack the ways that objectivities um, or idea of objectivity was actually perpetuated racist ideology, racist practices, racist curriculum. I put some, the name of some early prominent CRT scholars, but I really just wanna mention that at its core, critical race theory was and is anti-racist theory and practice. And so as the presentation continues and as folks continue to talk about critical race theory, and the movement to ban critical race theory, I want you to remember that at the core, the ban on critical race theory is this ban on anti-racist thinking um, and practice. Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Robles, as mentioned. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Criminal Justice. So good to be here with the Black Student Union who invited us as well as uh, all other participants here today. Um, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on the tenets of CRT. Uh, basically the tenets are the foundational principles of CRT, understanding uh, the ideology, uh, the theory itself in practice a little bit more. Um, as Cindy mentioned eloquently, uh, the centrality and intersectionality of race and racism is at the core. Uh, it's really an investigation in looking at how race and racism have been impacted and how these prolonged sort of policies have impacted uh, the precedent that's set today in terms of how we interact, what we learn about, uh, how we function, how we associate. And so uh, at the pinnacle, those principles uh, really center in terms of the centrality and intersectionality of race and racism themselves. Um, another principle is the challenge of the dominant ideology. Uh, when we hear of these conversations of uh, critical race theory being challenged in the K through 12 setting, it's really important to preface that critical race theory is not necessarily being taught formally in the K through 12 setting at this time. Um, if you've ever had an interaction in uh, learning critical race theory in your K through 12 uh, setting, um, please let me know. I would love to send my student or my kids to that school. Um, <laughs> and so one thing I wanna just focus on in terms of the dominant ideology is it's really looking at what has been continually taught, not necessarily in the K through 12 setting, but in all institutions, uh, what's being uh, pushed for, what frameworks are they operating from? And honestly, what's being left out? And that's really what the investigation is looking at is what sort of lens, what perspectives are being left out of the conversation and why aren't they being uh, put to the forefront? And why aren't we having these conversations on the realities of our history and the realities of the impacts of these histories? Um, the other commitment is to social justice. Um, CRT emphasizes social justice in the sense of uh, pushing forth equity, pushing forth uh, this standard of understanding uh, not only oneself, but a collective. Uh, it definitely pushes forth a collectivity uh, in terms of how we practice, how we learn. Um, and, and focusing on the next point, uh, the experiential knowledge uh, really aligns with practices that we even see today in higher education. Uh, we have different forms of uh, standardization that exists that we can admit have fallen in line of certain dominant ideologies, um, but we start, we're starting to see a lot of new programs make their way into the spectrum of higher education, such as our uh, competency-based learning, uh, competency-based education programs that really allow for students to mold their education and approach their education in different ways. And that's one of the facets of the critical race theory itself is, is really trying to incorporate these different learning styles, these different approaches, um, so that everyone can be on an equitable playing field. Um, the last thing I wanna focus on is the interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, critical race theory is not just siloed in the sense of a critical framework, 
but it also is initiated and, and, and uh, ma has manifested in many other frameworks uh, and pedagogies, ways of learning. Uh, we have a lot of feminist, intersectional feminist theory that comes from it. We have a lot of uh, Chicanx uh, pedagogy that comes from it. These different sort of uh, hip hop pedagogy that comes from it. So these different sort of ways of learning, uh, these theories of education have really stimulated from the foundation of critical race theory in this thought process. Um, so hopefully that answers a little bit about the principles that exist uh, in terms of critical race theory. If you still have questions, we have a lot more to, uh, to showcase and, and provide for you. Um, so we have some examples on how critical race theory is currently being challenged. Um, so I'll take, uh, hand, the, hand the mic over to uh, Emily Thompson. So, hi everyone, my name is Emily Thompson. I'm the CBE program manager here at Salt Lake Community College. And my background is in post-colonial literature with an emphasis on the African diaspora and studying how trauma from colonization is represented in story and how reading those stories and understanding those stories helps us to build empathy, care and compassion so that we can transform our society and become more equitable. So, I'm going to talk about the origins of the anti-critical race theory resolution. I posted in the chat a link to a document that has a list of all of the different sources that I'm going to mention here so that you're welcome to look through those on your own time. Um, it started with a memo on training in the federal government that was under President Trump. He had Russell Vought, who was the drafter of the memo. And what they found was that People had been coming to them and saying, they're making us talk about racism and anti-racism and systemic racism. It's making us feel uncomfortable. We don't like this. And so they issued a memo asking for the, or basically banning it in any federally contracted funded workplace and asking that people go into these places and find out and gather information and anybody that's teaching it so that they can be defunded. So the original intent of this is to chill conversation and instill fear so that we're not having these dialogues anymore. Since Russell Vought has left the White House, he has created a site called the Center for Renewing America. And I just want us to take a moment and read the rhetoric of this site. So he says, proponents of critical race theory use our university campuses to radicalize our own children transforming them into angry successor ideology activists. They use their control of HR departments and boardrooms of corporate America to impose this radicalism in all private workplaces. Their organized mobs terrorize private citizens with a cancel culture that seeks to erase the people and ideas who refuse to adopt their totalitarian mindset. So this is the language that is being copied into the bills that are now being passed. They've copied language directly from that memo. But I really want us to pay attention to the language here because it explicitly says that they are trying to erase people and ideas. But these bills are explicit efforts to ban and erase ideas. And so there's a contradiction here that's really important to keep in mind as we continue to engage in this conversation. I think it's really important to actually look at the language and to understand what we're speaking for and advocating for. So we're going to take a minute and actually look at the resolution. And this has passed both the House and the Senate in Utah, and it is waiting for signature at the governor's office. So this resolution recognizes the importance of appropriate education on history, civil rights, and racism. It identifies risks of critical race theory in public education and makes recommendations to the Utah State Board of Education regarding the prohibition of certain concepts. So there is an explicit effort to prohibit concepts that fall into this category. I wanna take a moment and just think about the language here. Some ideas is incredibly vague, right? That could mean anything. Prohibition of certain concepts Again, that's really vague. What concepts? Which ones within critical race theory are problematic? What are we challenging here? So here they've resolved, and I'll go ahead and let you read that one on your own, but I want us to pay attention to the underlined language. A 
A term that we hear a lot in regards to critical race theory is revisionist history. And here there's this notion of historical accuracy. When we think about history, the very purpose of history is to look at documents, look at ideas, look at things that have happened and put them next to each other and try to interpret and analyze and understand. So the act of creating history is in itself an act of revision. It is an act of trying to analyze and interpret. So this notion of historical accuracy comes with a singular lens, one person, one idea that defines history and prohibits every other idea that is not deemed to fit within that. It says, concepts contained in critical race theory degrade important societal values if introduced in classrooms would harm students learning in the public education system. Now, these are the critical concepts that they are holding up as problematic in critical race theory. And I actually agree with the points that are made here. I think most of us would, right? It's not realistic that one race is inherently superior or inferior to another because race is a social construct. But it is something that is built into our system. And it is something that has been used to construct the laws of our society. And so it is a social construct that has very real lived implications for the people who are considered outside of the white experience. So it says towards the bottom, no training or training material that the Board of Education or local education agency provides include concepts described in the above paragraph. These are the terms that they are deeming relevant to critical race theory. I'm just gonna take a moment and let you read that and maybe explore. Have you said any of these words recently? Have you used them? Have you talked about them? Any of these terms could fall under some concepts. So imagine what that does to the classroom. Imagine trying to teach in this environment. Which words are going to get me in trouble? Which words will cause me to violate the law? What happens if my student brings these ideas up? Am I accountable for that too? These are the states that are currently enacting or have enacted laws that ban critical race theory. And now I want us to take a look at a scenario. So under this new law, the question is, can we talk about the US Constitution? So in the US Constitution, there's a three-fifths clause. The three-fifths clause says that representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among several states, which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed and three fifths of all other persons. Can this be taught? What about the Federalist Papers? that were used to think through and plan and make arguments for the Constitution. The Federalist Papers are far more explicit. It's something that's often cited by anti-CRT proponents. Slaves are considered as property, not as persons. Can we have a discussion with our students about how this influences the law in our country, that this is a founding ideology, a founding belief and attitude that influences the way that we now think about and build laws and create opportunities in our society. Now I wanna look at some community college outcomes. These are outcomes at our community college right now. Analyze and discuss how identity with its deep roots in culture, language, religion, race, ethnicity, geography, and relationship to power affects processes, 
institutions, decision-making outcomes and attitudes related to politics at whatever level. Social work, looking at the welfare of disenfranchised groups. How do we have that conversation? If we can't talk about race, if we can't talk about diversity, if we can't talk about equity. Surgical technology, gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity. So I have, I want to look at how we're affecting it in Utah right now, but first we're going to take a moment and we're going to do a Jamboard exercise. So there's a link to the Jamboard in the chat, but I want you to take a moment and think about the word appropriate. So the word appropriate is written into the law here. Just take a moment and define for your, yourself, what does appropriate mean to you? And then I want you to think for a minute, have there ever been situations in your life where what you deemed was appropriate was different than somebody else? And what was the impact of that? What about when that person had more power than you? Have you all heard of DeAndre Arnold? DeAndre Arnold was not allowed to walk at his graduation because he had dreadlocks. And while he was away on holiday, school holiday, they implemented a policy that said that students could not have dreadlocks and male students couldn't have hair that went to their shoulders. So it led to some, well, before that, actually the Crown Act. But this is an idea where the idea of appropriate excluded black hairstyles. And this student was not able to have a positive high school experience and graduate with his classmates because he had dreadlocks. So that is a very blatant example of where appropriate differs and where power harms. So here we've got objectivity. I like this. This is a really important one. I think this idea of objectivity is what helps us make these rules, right? We assume I have an objective belief that everybody else must also agree with, therefore we're okay. But how many beliefs do we actually have that are like that? If we just look at this definition of appropriate, we've got several different ones. Makes sense for the situation, normal, based on social norms, conforming, right? It's in the eye of the beholder. Okay, so the last thing I wanna to touch on is just the direct impact on the state so far. So we have a group called Utah Parents United who is actively working to comb through classrooms. They've given a call out to parents and said, find everything you can that we can take to the legislature in 2022. They managed to get social emotional learning, which is a Utah State Board of Education requirement in schools removed from the Canyon School District. The reason they had it removed was because it linked to a website called Love is Respect. Love is Respect is an anti-domestic violence website. It teaches children and teenagers how to have relationships and identify the dangers of abuse. But because it talked about consent, it was removed. The entire program was removed because of a link to one website that talked about consent. This is a call made by the Utah State Board of Education member. And I, it's really important as we think about these concepts like critical race theory, what is the coded language that is being used to influence how people think about this and why they're so afraid of it? So pornographic, that is code language for consent-based education, right? Love is respect is considered pornographic by this group. Anti-American, that is code for looking at systemic racism, inequity built into the system, injustice. Anti-family is code for anything that supports the LGBT community, anything that supports a 
cis, non cisgender heteronormative family. So as we see these words, we need to know what they actually mean. Okay, with that, I think I'll pass it over. Anthony, are you taking this? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep, I will. Again, thanks so much for everybody coming. Students, staff, uh, administrators here, uh, and uh, community members. We have over about 74, 75 people uh, online that are attending as well. So we are easily over 100 people on this event uh, that we're doing out of our voluntary time. Uh, so what one might uh, say, uh, our service, but I would say that we're doing this because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it's, it's the history of academia, you know, that was established in the Greek, uh, you know, time periods, um, looking at what is democracy, right? What is justice? What is freedom? And these are uh, questions that are rooted in a field that I and David are in called criminology. And uh, this is the central theme of criminology and criminal justice. So you ask us, uh, why are two criminologists on this topic? Because we are, you know, uh, required by our department as well as our occupation and our field to discuss issues around justice, harm, uh, and what uh, deems one to be a crime today might not be a deem a crime tomorrow or, or yesterday. So we look at AUP, hopefully, let's see on um, the raise of uh, physical hands. I can't see virtual hands, but uh, physical hands. Does anybody know what AAUP stands for? Okay, I was hoping justice was uh, the former president of faculty association. I'm very involved uh, today, uh, beautiful person. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, AAUP, if you don't know what it is, please get involved. American Association of University Professors. It is one of the most powerful intellectual, uh, scholarly, uh, community uh, organizing uh, associations for professors on a national as well as international level. And they, they, they have come up with a lot of constitutional statements and uh, we'll begin uh, using AUP's definition of academic freedom. And I'll just kind of go through it really quickly, but, uh, Teachers are entitled to full freedom in research and the publication of the results subject to the adequate performance of their other uh, academic duties, right? Uh, as well as at this institution and many others, um, we actually encompass, it's called SOTL um, in the faculty development office. We try to encompass our research in our classrooms, which is wonderful. We try to publish our students or have conferences with our students. We do research with our students under IRB, et cetera. Teachers are entitled to freedom in the classroom and discussing their subject, but they, they should be careful not to induce into their teaching controversial matters, which has no relationship to their subject, which controversial is a subjective term, right? And most recently I was in a conversation and said, do you feel that your teaching uh, is allowed at Salt Lake Community College uh, around controversial subjects? And I'm like, can you define what controversial means? Does that make sense to everybody? Um, because for me, controversial uh, is not, for example, controversy is a dialogue where two people are debating and there is truth on both sides or facts on both sides, right? Racism is not controversial to me. Racism is wrong. It's not a controversial issue. Women having the right to vote is not controversial to me. It's never been controversial. Uh, people with disabilities having the right to go to school is not controversial to me. If we should go to Mars or not, that's controversial, right? Like there you have a topic that has different sides, um, but it's not about freedom and liberation. Does that make sense? So we have to really understand and be scholars and examine every single point and every single topic, which Emily did a wonderful job in doing. So limitations of academic freedom because of religion or other aims in this institution should be clearly stated in writing at the time of the appointment. College and university teachers are citizens. 
okay? And this was uh, brought up in faculty senate as well as faculty association and a number of other uh, committees at Salt Lake Community College recently. So please listen, record, et cetera. College and university teachers are citizen members of law and profession and officers of an educational institution. When they speak or write as citizens, they should be free from the institutional censorship and discipline, but their special position in the community imposes special obligations. So whatever you say, you should have facts to pull those up. Right, that's what you know. The, the next sentence is pretty much saying, as, as scholars and educational officers, they should remember that the public may judge their professional and their institution by their their comments, their writing, their presentation, and their research. Right, just like we on this panel might be judged or uh, ridiculed on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram for what we are saying as we defend critical race theory, racial justice, and social justice and human rights. So those are a little bit about academic freedom. And now we'll begin to talk a little bit about academic repression, a field I coined uh, and developed, uh, and I'm working on uh, my fifth book on this. And this comes out of uh, a quote that uh, we, we established, Eric Juergensmeyer, myself, and Mark Cease, uh, in a book called Academic Repression, The Fall of Academic Freedom and the Era of Trump. Uh, and you can find it online, et cetera. As it currently, and anybody that's interested in the school to prison pipeline, I intertwine, and that's one of my large fields, I intertwine the school to prison pipeline with academic repression. So people that are interested in academic uh, school to prison pipeline might be interested in this statement. As it currently exists in our schools and our curriculum, academic repression threatens our democracy. And I talked about democracy as the foundation and purpose um, of why education exists in the first place, to create a healthy democracy, right? Colleges exist to create a healthy democracy. Due to neoliberalism, systemic nature of pervasiveness, it has become more than a strategy or tactic, academic repression. It is an ideology, a theory, um, uh, that it is beyond our classroom halls. Nichella, myself, um, I don't want to speak in third person, that's kind of funny. Uh, and Jurgens Meyer. So we, we write in another book on policing the campus. Academic repression is the strategic uh, strategy to target, control, and eliminate a person or group of people for their idea, ideas, actions, or identity by those in authority within the school or academic system. In evaluating the methods of uh, and goals of academic repression, we can see that it is a strategy which on the surface appears apolitical. But upon further inspection, it is in, in product a neoliberalism ideological agenda. This, this agenda aims to commodify and restrict the educational experience to a monolithic form of economic calculus. Uh, unfortunately, this most common targets of academic oppression are the same as the, the school to prison pipeline, which is people of color uh, or BIPOC people, uh, people with disabilities, LGBTQIA people, and people with, that are economically disadvantaged. Academic repression differs from repression created by the school to prison pipeline because academic repression targets two more types of people, critics and dissenters, i.e. activists or community organizers. Critics are targeted because they note the hip, uh, hypocrisy or hypocritical vision and mission offered by administrators or the mission of an organization saying that, hey, we're supposed to do this, but we're actually doing this. That's a critic, right? Just to bring up ideas out of committee or department or program, okay? Uh, where the center, as I noted, kind of challenges issues of oppression, not because they are having fun and it's something that they love to do on the weekends or Friday night, but because they're fighting for social justice, equity, and inclusion for people that are marginalized and oppressed. Moreover, while academic repression targets students, teachers, and staff, as well as administrators, the, the school to prison pipeline only targets students. Beyond these dif uh, differences, audience and academic repression um, are very similar, okay? So tactics used in academic or uh, repression academic freedom, okay? To uh, repress academic freedom. Limit the ability on course materials, pedagogy, and practices. Request regular assessments and reviews. 
limit academic freedom by defending concepts, values within a modernist, uh, such as modernity, such as equality, fairness. We've got to be fair to everybody. Um, so you can't have pens or paper, or you can't have speak that about this, or um, you can't do this and this. I'm, I'm biased. A very, I, I am biased. I like the Mets or Yankees more than I do the Red Sox. Bias, by its definition, is not a problematic term, just like being judgmental. We have to really get in the literature of what we're talking around social justice. So we're really talking about prejudice and discrimination or bigotry. So these are code terms, right? Just like code terms of hate or anti-hate uh, rhetoric. We uh, Many universities are using anti-hate rather than saying anti-discrimination or anti-prejudice because anybody can be hateful. And yes, I do hate uh, you know, pineapples. I do hate a lot of things, but should I be fired for not liking or not hating certain things? Like I hate racism. So should I be fired for that? Does that make sense? So hate is a very subjective framework, but everybody can be targeted for it. So compared employees for the goals of promotion and similarity, sameness and normalcy uh, to promote hegemony, a, a term, as I noted, a talk about Antonio Gramsci, striving to isolate individuals, getting them to work on the weekends, not allowed to come to meetings, et cetera. Stringer, administrators who pressed information on others to create a paper trail that vision and fear. Set up meetings within, uh, and this is actually in two books. I wish I cited the two books um, uh, that was published by on public administration and nonprofits uh, in a public administration program that I was teaching at Syracuse University, um, the best public administration program in the country was actually teaching on when to fire someone. So the best time to fire someone in uh, is typically on a Friday evening. Um, so they can't complain and, and most people are leaving the office. Lack and praise and support of employees, lack and promotion of collaboration and gaslighting whistleblowers. And we know about whistleblowers um, most recently, which um, is articulated in the book Dialectic of the Enlightenment, which is uh, Ardorno and, uh, and Horkheimer. Okay, so how are, and then Gina, uh, the, the president of faculty uh, or the staff association at Salt Lake Community College will be taking over after I, I take on this slide. And here's some of the books that I've done. Um, so if you're interested, I am the editor of them, but these are all voices of people. So if you say, oh, so who's been, who's been oppressed, et cetera, these are all voices um, in all these books of people from around the, of the world. Join an, organi uh, an organization that defends you, such as AUP, Slick Faculty Association, Slick Staff Association, or student clubs. We have Black Student Union here. So join them. Who's the president? Who's the vice president of Black Student Union? Any presidents? Okay, to be determined, we have a beautiful Gloria, who's the advisor, right? So, and Gloria has put, I, I don't know if I should say, but put her neck out and defended these students left and right. And I think that's something very, very important. When you pick your advisor, make sure you have somebody that really cares about the students. So she speaks out strongly um, and uh, respectfully, as well as uh, unapologetically. So thank you so much for everything you do. I've learned from you a lot. So tell others, uh, document, do not isolate yourself. The three Ps, publicize, publish, and present. Request mediations with witnesses. Organize others with uh, you to build a collective, unified power to fight back against academic repression. A union, right? We don't have too many of them here, but unions are good. Um, I bleed union I'm from Philadelphia, so I, I better. Um, do research on the issue of the person, then engage in activism um, through media coverage, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So without any further ado, I'll let the president of Staff Association take over. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as hey, hey, right, I, I love it. <laughs> so as stated, um, I am the president of Staff Association, but I'm also a coordinator of student affairs here at Salt Lake Community College. I'm gonna go ahead and go through these slides because um, I wanna open it up for some Q&A in case people still have questions exactly about what is critical race theory and why is it important that we defend it? So we wanna open it up after I finish for some real uh, deep down discussion, right? Because we are in an institution of higher ed, so we need to get that critical mental thinking, right? So uh, on this slide, there are four approaches after becoming socio 
politically um, conscious about a form of oppression, AKA that just means about becoming woke, meaning that you know what's going on. There are four ways in which you might respond to that. Um, you could respond in either one of the four or you may actually experience all four. First, there is depression. You might get depressed about you know, uh, what's going on. As a black person, when I see a lot of stuff going on that affect me and my people, I get depressed about it. It's real, it's real. Um, and it's not a depression that can just, um, that I can easily just get over, right? Because we know that there are systemic issues that perpetuate the racism that my people, we, we face every day. So it's not easy just to get over a, a depression for something that not has happened, but that continues to happen. Another thing, anger. I get angry a lot. <laughs> and you may, even if you don't identify with, you know, me as a black heterosexual woman, you may identify or you may relate to some of the things, or you may have empathy. So you might get angry on my behalf. I appreciate that if you do. Uh, engagement. Once you either go through depression or anger, then you engage. And engaging just means being active about that thing, whether you are like my uh, friends and brothers and sisters here on this panel and my daughter uh, with us today, you know, ways that we might engage is they took time out of their busy schedules to help come here and educate uh, on critical race theory. Uh, they may not identify as black or, you know, anything, but they, they engage with their time to educate so we can always do something or we can just be willfully ignorant, right? We can just sit on the sideline and be like, ah, this don't impact me or ah, I don't understand. I come from a certain background. I've never had to deal with this. Um, so I'm not going to either do anything. I'm going to remain willfully ignorant or I'm going to allow the people that this impacts to do the work. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to just sit. If you have privilege and we all have some form of privilege, you might just sit back in your privilege and say, ah, well, you know, that's their problem. Um, but I hope that in any of these, if you experience any of these, that you do take the time to engage and actually become active and not remain uh, willfully ignorant. All right, so we're looking at roles in social change for peace. And just for alliteration's sake, they all begin with the letter P. So we have, uh, you could be a peacekeeper, and that's simply just someone who uh, de-escalates or prevents a situation from escalating and becoming violent. You could be a peace educator, someone that is educating peaceably about the situation that's going, was that me? <laughs> Okay, let me see. Yeah, Mike, come help sister out. Okay, so you can become a peace educator um, or a peace activist. Um, my brother right here, Anthony Nochella, this, this guy got my heart, like real talk. He is one of the most peaceful activist persons that I know. Anthony Nochella not only uh, talks the talk, but he walks it as well, right? Um, he puts on a lot of um, uh, social activist workshops that can teach you how to peaceably engage with things that are going on to take a stand against things that are not okay. So if you were ever interested in doing that, Shout out or uh, reach out to Anthony Nochella and we can put these workshops on where you can actually be a peaceful demonstrator or a peaceful activist. The peacemaker, we need peacemakers. Um, <laughs> some people can be a little aggressive or antagonistic in their approach and that's okay because we sometimes need that because I'm sorry to say, but that's sometimes the only language some people speak. Sometimes you gotta get a little defensive and aggressive with people in order to get them to understand because maybe we've been too passive for too long and people don't understand that passivity, right? So then when I get a little angry with you, then that kind of lights a fire up under you to let you know that, hey, time has come that we make a change, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But we also need those peacemakers because there are some people that will say, well, this is an issue I'm not really ready to risk a lot on. And because of that, I wanna get involved, I wanna engage, but I don't wanna do it 
Now that ain't me, y'all. <laughs> but I don't want to do it in a manner that's going to um, cause me to look like the rebel rouser, the radical, or any other negative term that is associated with activism. So we need those peacemakers. Then we also have peace builders. Um, Martin Luther King himself was a peace builder, a peacemaker, a peace activist, a peace educator, and a peace keeper. God bless him, because <laughs> I don't know if I can let you throw something at me and I'll be all right with that and not respond. But we need people like that. We need people that will take a stand as all of these peace builders, keeper, activists, educators, et cetera, to show you that regardless of how you treat us, we're not going nowhere. We're going to continue to push forward in a peaceable manner or maybe in an all means necessary manner. I guess it just depends. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has six steps for us. Um, the first step is information gathering. So I would consider that what we're doing here today, this is information gathering. You've come out, you are taking the time to be educated to find out what CRT is, why it needs to be defended, what CRT, meaning critical race theory, is not. Um, gathering information. I would encourage you to not let today's experience be your first or your last. Don't just take our word for what we're saying. Go out and do the research yourself. Become educated. So I'm going to share this. <laughs> we have a little chat that we, uh, we communicate through. And on this, um, this text chat, there was a clip sent of a, a gentleman in Virginia. <laughs> that uh, when asked for the Virginia election, what was the most important issue, Homeboy said critical race theory was the most important issue in the Virginia election. When the interviewer asked him, well, what is critical race theory? He was like, uh, well, well, uh, uh, well I, I just don't wanna get into that right now. I mean, cause he had no idea of what critical race theory is and was, but yet, he felt that was the most important issue in the Virginia, uh, Virginia election. Don't be like him, y'all. <laughs> know what you're talking about, know what you're standing for or what you're standing against. Take the time to information gather and to become educated. Once you have information gathered, once you have become educated, now it's time for you to make a personal commitment, not a commitment that I might want you to make not a commitment that your mama wants you to make, your church wants you to make, your job wants you to make, et cetera. It's a personal commitment. What are you as an individual willing to do about whatever situation it is that you are either standing for or against? It has to be personal. At that point, negotiation. There might be some negotiation. What am I willing again to risk? I have to think this thing through because sometimes being quick to take action may have repercussions you never thought about. But when you think about the repercussions beforehand, whether good or bad, because not all repercussions are bad. When you think about them beforehand, well, if I do this, this may happen, then you can begin to strategize and think about negotiations of how to get whatever it is you're trying to get may be done. Direct action. Again, what you gonna do about it? Are you gonna take all the information that you have just gathered and learned and then sit on it, going back to that last slide of how you can react, number four, willful ignorance, or are you going to actually do something? And doing something does not necessarily mean it has to be something, um, again, antagonistic. Doing something can be just as easy as hearing somebody say something inappropriate and then saying something to that person. And then reconciliation, that's always the bottom line, is reconciling. So how do we come together as a people to, to um, look for amicable solutions, not antagonistic solutions, right? Because we are human beings, we gotta inhabit this world together. So how do we do that peaceably and amicably? All right, this is by uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Giovanni Nocella. Wasn't sure if I was supposed to let that out, but it's out. <laughs> so we have uh, four methods of gathering political power. There is the economic leverage, 
your favorable facts and truths, your social capital and status, and then your massive community support. Dr. Nocella, did you want to elaborate on any of this? I guess he's done talking. <laughs> The five C's are responding to repression. Okay, so you have your three that are considered positive responses, then your two that are negative responses, combating, confronting, or coping. You have a neutral, then you have concluding and canceling. You have to decide where on that line of five C's you are. So there are ways that you can get involved. And we'll share some of those. And then, like I said, we're going to open this up for discussion. Uh, you can co-sponsor events. So, Lexi and Ian, thank you so much for providing space and place. So you can attend events. Thank you for those that took the time to come out in person and for those of you that are joining us uh, virtually online. You can share events on your TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. You can donate. That can be your time. It can be your money, it can be your resources, but you can donate to help out whatever passionate cause that you stand for. You can present like what we're doing, you can publish or you can publicize. Ah, you can become an organizer and an activist, such as attend press conferences, visuals, protests, community organizations and collectives, teach-ins, workshops. You can have stickers on your computer or your car. I don't know about that. I ain't going to face my car. But <laughs> you can hold banners. Uh, and, and we do in um, the workshops that Dr. Nocella be putting on about uh, activism, we create banners. Um, we take pictures with those banners um, because we're making a stance, right? We are saying, this is what I believe in. This is what I am willing to, to go to bat for. Uh, you can also post on your social media site, you can donate to causes, and you can support social justice movements. You can promote and support one another and uplift them. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It really means a lot. Um, I know everybody's got things going on. Uh, so supporting each other and uh, building friendships, that's very, very important. Absolutely. This is a work that it has to be done by all of us. Right, not just one people group, not just you know a couple of people, but in order for us to get the institution, society, et cetera, to where we're trying to get it to be, it's gonna take the work of all of us. We all, we all, we all have to be willing to risk something. But again, you have to determine what you are willing to risk in order to make the changes that need to be made. I'm gonna turn the time over now to uh, our Black Student Union leader, Sharifa Harrigan, to. Uh, moderate the Q&A or the questions in the chat. And also, uh, if you have questions in the audience, just raise your hand and she'll bring you the mic. Thank you. Okay, that was amazing. Thank you all again. Does anyone have any questions that would like to get us started off? In the audience or in the chat? Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We do actually need to just speak to the mic because it's a webinar. Just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Michaela Cox. Um, I am, I guess you would say, a peace activist in this space in Salt Lake City, Utah. My question is, is have we gone through the current structure that society has currently accepted, the history that we've all been taught in elementary and middle school, and dissected the ways in which the current narrative uphold the CRT? Because I do think that if we're gonna be real about it, what's currently being taught is a form of CRT. It's just in favor of whiteness, which is a word we're not allowed to use evidently anymore. Um, so I wanna know like, have we done that research and that work? Because I think maybe helping them understand that the current model that they accept falls in alignment with the current models that they don't want to um, accept or that they are against. So I'm wondering if anybody is doing that work. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Um, and absolutely, I think this is something that I think about a lot as a white educator, right? Um, and 
when we talk about critical race theory and the sphere of discomfort or shame, we're very much prioritizing right white student comfort, white student right. experience of shame. And how do we start to have a conversation where we can hold that tension just like everybody else has already been holding it all the time, right? Our students of the global majority carry this tension already. And we're freaking out because it's like, we're just starting to tap it and just starting to understand it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really critical question. I don't work in K through 12, but I've taken my kids out of the K through 12 system because I don't, I, I don't want my black son to experience, like he was excluded from registering while my white daughter was let right in, right? Those are examples of systemic racism right here in Canyon School District. And they never apologized. They didn't take ownership of it. And it was like, we're not gonna put you in a place that won't even let you in because they assume that you probably don't belong before you've even started because you checked the box on the form. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I'm not sure if I've answered it fully or if anybody else wants to add to that. Well, just that Emily did provide a couple of examples of just that, like here, and the example was were the Federalist Papers, the Constitution, like even within what they think is, you know, not race related. And that's part of the problem, right? Part of the problem is that um, because of the way whiteness and white supremacy work is we think of that as not a race, um, but we it's clearly embedded. Um, even looking through the, what's the website that Heritage Foundation website, um, part of their argument is that CRT tends to make education political as if it's apolitical. So Emily did provide a couple of examples, which we, we are happy to share the um, PowerPoint later of using CRT to critique or, sh or show people who are opposed to CRT exactly the way that it's taught now is CRT. Right. Right. But also part of the problem is that they don't know what CRT it is. is. Right. Yeah. Last point, I think we should also add get involved politically because that's where all the decisions are being made and we can all share on social media, but our senators and our representatives are super comfortable not having to be addressed. So definitely address your political leaders. Yeah, I love that. Um, just centering even the, the pressure and the uh, forward thinking on the Utah State Board of Education where many of these initiatives and policies uh, first are grounded is, is a place to start. And I think sometimes we uh, neglect the Utah State Board of Ed um, and uh, those sort of actions lead to bills like this being pushed forward uh, under the shadows and behind closed doors. And so um, it's really important to also apply uh, and push forth your voice onto the Utah State Board of Ed. Thank you. Uh, next question. So we do have a question in the chat um, and I'm happy to read that and then somebody else can take it. Um, but it says to add on to that question, have we asked educators in the current school K through 12, their thoughts on teaching critical race theory? Why do they think that this should or shouldn't be taught? And would administration allow for a survey to go around from students from SLCC? Are there any K through 12 educators or future educators in the audience? Well, I'm already like, okay, that's my class's semester project next next semester. I don't know. I don't know if it formally has been. Unions, um, unions around the country that are strong are unions that are strong uh, around the country are addressing it um unions in chicago are addressing this very much so and very much supportive of it um you'll see the states that are have very weak unions um uh don't have a collective identity and thus um these the this bill and this type of bill is easier to pass so uh yeah it's being addressed uh on a national level and many unions are organizing and discussing this at forums such as this uh and then would administrators allow for a survey to go around from students uh, uh from students from salt lake community college i think uh the provost as well as 
uh, um, many student clubs, student organizations, as well as faculty senate are very much interested in the feedback and thoughts about this particular topic. Uh, and at all levels, I believe they're discussing it. So um, yeah, I would say the last one and would administrators um, allow for a survey? I would say yes. Um, that's all I can say uh, because it seems like everybody wants to talk about it and have a conversation about it. If I can just also add to that, I think um, one of the problems that we are seeing is that uh, a lot of people are just jumping on the bandwagon, right? Um, you have people that have no idea what critical race theory is, yet they're they're reading what they are, you know, they're believing rather what they're reading, as opposed to taking the time to fact find for themselves, right? So you might see some negative stuff go up on a social media site in the news saying, hey, this is why we need to keep critical race theory out of school. And instead of people, again, taking the time to fact find, they just jump on that bandwagon and say, oh, no, I don't want my child to learn that. But then when you look at what critical race theory is and the presentation that was just done, okay, so to say we ban critical race theory, what can we talk about? <laughs> and why is it that we can talk about anything and everything except race? Why is it that race, the social construct that has us in the predicament that we are in, why is that the most taboo topic that everybody and their mama scared to touch? Like it, it, it gets to the point where once you know better as the saying goes in the church circles I roll in, you do better. So when you become educated about something, David can't come to me and say, hey, this is why we need to do A, B, and C without me being like, okay, David, hold on, what are we talking about? I mean, those, as we call it in the hood, those ride or die days are over where I'm just gonna go and jump on in the car with you and go do something, I don't know what you're going to do because you my boy. Absolutely not. I'm gonna take the time to educate myself on what I'm getting myself into because whatever the repercussions are, they're gonna impact me. <laughs> so I think if people take the time, few minutes, as it said, the Googles are at our fingertips. Google it, read about it, and don't just stop at the first article you read, but dig deeper. Let one article lead you to another article. Let that article lead you to another article. You know, come and interact with the scholars and uh, professors that we have here at the institution. Take the time again, even if you still, after you've gathered all that information, feel like this is not something you want to be a part, that's fine. Just get the information for yourself. Thank you. We have a question in the audience. Hi, um, my name is Boringo, and um, we have it reiterated this multiple times during um, the panel today, but I want us to touch clear and solidify this answer once and for all, because it has baffled me that, you know, people don't do their research, like Ms. Gina just mentioned, they jump in the back wagon, and they don't want their kids to learn about this. Um, a very interesting statement that I heard a woman make, and I think she was talking to senators, was um, she doesn't want her kids to know about race because they're too young to understand it, you know, or, um, you know, she, of course, she started crying in the audience, and her kid is too uh, little to listen to this. And that has been, you know, the train, the background, and that multiple parents have jumped on and said, "Oh, kids are too little to um, learn about race," or, um, you know, the color blind statement that everybody gives, where it's like, "Oh, there's no such thing as race. Let them just love each other." In this panel, I want what are our panelists? If this woman was addressing you today with these um, accusations of we don't see color, let them love each other, um, my kids cannot understand race, what would you say um, that will so that solidify and educate other people so they're not jumping on that bandwagon with her? For me, the way I would approach it is to first of all, help her understand that she has a parental responsibility to her children. It is not up to the education system to teach her children. Teaching starts in the home with the parents, right? letter A, and then letter B, I would encourage her, yeah, help your kids to see color. Because when you see me, I need you to see my color. I need you to also see that my color is different than David's color. It's different than Emily's color. Because once you understand that, then you know how to interact with me. You know how to interact with David. You know how to interact with Emily and so on and so forth. And you also understand that our needs are different. 
So I need you to be able to understand that and differentiate that. I don't need you to look at David as a man of color and then me as a black woman and say, oh, well, they're both people of color. So therefore let's group them the same and then treat them the same because that's not how it goes. We are people of color, but we come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences, different walks of life and different things that have impact us and affect us differently. So you have to interact with us accordingly. That's how I would approach her. And then I would also help her to educate or not help her, but yeah, help her to um, educate herself or encourage her to educate herself because what she is saying will obviously be perpetuated in her children. And then her children grow up probably even, you know, just reading and jumping on a bandwagon or not even giving thought to it at all because it has never been something that was addressed in the home. We have to move beyond that. Would anyone else like to answer? I, I would just also say to her, that's actually inaccurate. Like we know that, that kids see, mm -hmm. perhaps if conversations about race aren't happening, they still are seeing color. And they're also understanding from lessons in the home, from lessons in the media, that certain value and characteristics are attributed to different color. Like they, it's actually an inaccurate. Um, and then I would educate her about colorblindness and give, show her some examples of like how colorblind ideology in various institutions, my PhD is in education, but particularly in education is actually more detrimental. It is detrimental more than it is, than it is helpful. Um, so that's, I mean, it is inaccurate. Kids do see race. Um, and also kids of color experience race and experience racism, right? And so again, I think it goes back to this idea that white is not a race, that we it's invisible, we're, we're not having to think about it, but maybe her kid's not seeing race or her kid's not experiencing color, but non-white kids are. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Uh, just to mention, um, I don't know exactly how I would construct a sort of response to this parent, but I think something I would focus on is how colorblindness is the symptom of fragility. Uh, color, oh, can you hear me? There you go. Um, so I would, I would emphasize that colorblindness is the symptom of fragility. And this sense of fragility that we're encountering is also embedded within the fact that uh, the dominant culture has not had to acknowledge their race for a very long time. And now that this sort of racial underlinement is at the surface, uh, there begins to be this sensation and emotion of fragility of, we don't want to talk about race. We don't want to be racialized. We're past that. And the constructs that people of color have had to navigate for so long have been so embedded and so entrenched in our systems, in our daily functions, in our interactions, that we can't easily separate ourselves from that. You, your, your system created this and we are having to continue navigate it and for you to close your eyes and feel this symptom of fragility and say you're colorblind um, is an insult to your own system. Um, and, and it's an insult to us that have had to navigate it for so long as well. Thank you. I would just like to... And if, if there isn't parents, which a lot of youth don't have parents, I've worked in juvenile justice and, and youth uh, that are in the system, trapped in the system, uh, for those people that don't have guardians or parents, I would say us teachers um, can create a space and place for laboratory pedagogies and practices that speak about this um, and that challenge repressive pedagogies, which Henry Drew and I kind of wrote a number of things about, right? And if you really want to spend more time on this issue um, in a long-term way and work for the NAACP or Greenpeace or another social justice organization, we at this institution are working uh, and Cindy uh, and I, as well as I will, uh, I'll note uh, Roderick Lands, the Dean, uh, are, are working on a social justice piece in conflict studies um, AA and AS, which hopefully goes, and if you're interested in it, please take it. And we're also at Salt Lake Community College working on an ethnic studies program too. So thank you so much um, for Slick embracing this in a deliberate um, manner, um, in a formal educational manner. So we have to talk about these issues.
<laughs> or are we still talking about this hypothetical parent? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> I, I would really encourage folks to check out, and we did put it on the link, but we can send it out to attendees as well. Um, the list that Emily put up of, of what the Center for Renewing America is banning, that was just part of the list. I mean, they even got land acknowledgement on here. So I would really encourage um, everyone to check out that list uh, of terms. So um, I grew up in a biracial family. So my dad is white and my mom is black. So I taught that you don't see color, that you don't see race. And so I guess I'm having a hard time connecting the two. I'm having a hard time because I, I am, I'm a mixed woman. So I guess I don't have the same like complications as other people people uh, or of my community do. So I guess I'm having a hard time like connecting why race is important. I understand that there are problems within different communities and that there are problems within different cultures. So I guess in my in the way I view it is why do I have to see it as oh because they're a different race they have different problems than me rather than because they're a different person, they have different problems than me. If that makes sense. Like I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything. No, I think great. I'm just confused because I do I did grow up in a household being like, you don't see color, you see a person for their character rather than their race. And so I think that's where I'm having a hard time connecting the two. Yeah. Um, if I can take this. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge the systemic dichotomy that exists within our daily lives in terms of how we interact and how how we correspond to things but i think it's also important to look at the embedment of of policy uh when we had a justice system that was founded on the condemnation of black people and that condemnation has continued um where you have uh disparities and unequal forms of punishment in our correctional facilities and our tactics of policing, at least I'm speaking from my discipline, um, we have to acknowledge that race is at the forefront of a lot of decisions. And so when we start to look at it systemically and start to look at the numbers and say, why is there a higher percentage of black men being stopped and frisked in Newark police, uh, under the Newark Police Department jurisdiction, uh, we have to start aligning that there are strategies, there is an embedment of, of, of justice and, and what that looks like uh, in the real world in terms of grouping people in certain categories. And so when I, I can't you know, speak to your parents or, or in terms of their parenting practices and what their intentions were there, um, and I don't think your question is disrespectful at all, uh, but I can speak from my lens and my discipline, and that discipline is that we have a system, a justice system that has condemned uh, Black people at higher rates than the general public, the dominant public, and we have to understand that race has been a major factor, uh, the denominator, when it comes to a lot of these decisions. So... Okay, so then my question is, what can I do now that I'm being educated to avert my thought process from thinking that way? Because when I see a different person, I want to like just talk to them as a normal person. I don't really notice any of their struggles or anything like that. So how can I then to educate myself to... Oh, no, I got that. <laughs> How y'all doing? My name is Elijah Cottle, and yeah, I'm a student here. So, if you haven't seen uh, Colin in Black and White, it's on Netflix. Watch that. Shows him being a kid adopted by white parents, and they go along with a lot of stuff. Their parents want the best for him, but they ignore a lot of his diversity problems. Anyway, so when it comes down to it, I would like to say it's like being left-handed in the 1920s. So we're all right-handed. Everything we have is made for right-handed people. When we drink water, it's made for right-handed people. When we shoot a gun, it's made for right-handed people. Now, when you're going to school, 
you have that left-handed friend and he grabs a pair of scissors. The scissors was always made for right-handed people. The kid says, hey teacher, these scissors don't grip me. The teacher says, you'll get used to it. This kid grows up doing right-handed things and they learn to use their right hand and their left hand. One of those left-handed kids say, I don't want all right-handed things. I don't want to just learn how you have it. I want universal things. So they're starting to make self-checkouts that you can go to the right or the left so you can put your groceries up with your strong hand. They're universalizing a lot of things that we use. The thing is, we as right-handed people don't understand the struggles of what left-handed people go through. But the funny thing is, all we have to do is say, you know what, I'm with you. You may be able to learn what left-handed people have, or sorry, what right-handed people have, but I'm gonna speak out for you too, because I'm gonna get with you and see if they can make it universal. So even though, even though you don't have those problems, you want it to be equalized on every aspect, you know what I mean? So also problems that we don't grow up in, like Trayvon Martin, he didn't know walking down a certain community would get him shot. Ahmaud Aubrey, he didn't know running through a neighborhood would get him shot. Or he would be more paranoid. A lot of people say, oh, I don't have, I'm black. And I've never had problems with the cops. A lot of black people that got killed by the cops didn't have uh, problems with the cops until they got killed. So the reason why we have to talk about these things and bring these things to the surface is because the more we ignore it, the more people think it's not a problem. So when it does happen, this don't happen in 2021. It might have happened five years ago, but not in 2021. We ignore it because it's not talked about. We don't acknowledge these things. Yes, I might have a life of luxury for the rest of my life, but if I ignore the problems of somebody else that had that same life, oh, they were living a good life. They just got shot because they spoke out. I know not to uh, do certain things, and I know that I can't get away with certain things. But if I'm always speaking out when the cop's angry, I might just get shot. So if I'm not educated, to, hey, look, you have a more uh, chance of getting shot than your white friend or something like that, then um, I, I just, I just, you just need to educate yourself and bring it to the surface. You know what I mean? If, if that makes sense. Both of you. I think I also want to add that recognizing that we are racialized people is not the same as then declaring that everybody from those races is the same. It's about then what CRT helps us do is think about the ways because we're racialized is that we experience institutions differently based on those races. So making connections between um, the fact that black mothers die at higher rates when they're giving birth um, to also then connecting to the fact that we have um, black, black mothers person. being brutalized by the police at higher rates, then connecting that to the lack of access to education. That That is, those dots are not separate. Those are connected dots because of systemic racism. It's not necessarily a declaration of like, okay, we have racist, then all those stereotypes about the races then are accurate. Those are different things. Does that make sense? I also want to add that I don't think it's a bad thing that your parents taught you like not to see race. I think that they were trying to protect you and they taught you because you have like an ambiguous like look, they taught you how to survive in a world that they probably didn't have the luxury of doing. Um, but I think that part of seeing people as just people or as human beings is to say that I only see that Gina is a woman, but that doesn't tell me that she's hetero and that she loves the color blue and that she is an educator. There's a whole construct that makes up each individual and getting to know each facet of that individual is part of who they are. So only to see Gina as a black woman at that table, as an educator, as a scholar, would be to, to diminish the fact that that girl loves to cook. She loves to love, she loves, she's loud, she's beautiful, she's powerful. It's to diminish all the other aspects of beauty. So I think your parents taught you how to see people, but I think they're hoping that you learn to work, walk in the world and, and interact with that person and go deeper as you feel comfortable. So then I have another question that 
comes to that. So is critical race theory, like, I guess not mainly, but it's focused on the systemic part of it, right? So I guess like where I can see from where my parents are coming at is from like a moral standpoint. So where does that, where is that bridge at? Where, how does, how do those interact with each other? So I'll pick, oh. you go ahead. Well, I would just say, um, if you look at the system, you have a moral obligation to change the system. If you're looking and you're paying attention, you have an obligation to fix it. If you refuse to see it, then you can take the moral high ground without actually making the world a better place. And um, I just want to mention three things as we were speaking. I come from a different background altogether, right? I'm African. Um, our system in Cameroon is totally different from the system in America. But what happened? when you're in a system, you walk the rules. When you go to Rome, you do exactly what the Rome do. People look at me and they're not, again, back to the background she was talking about, it's not, oh, you're, they see you as black, they will treat you as such. So that system is important and it does affect the moral as she was talking about, which leads me to my second point. Most of the things that you are influential in your life is because of your experiences. So the system is affecting people and they're having different experiences. And it's hard to ignore that. You cannot base and the, the system as it is, as um, he was mentioning, is you cannot, you don't want to walk because it's luck. You you were not the lucky, you were the lucky black man who was not shot today, and then the other one was shot, and then you ignore that. Whatever somebody does to you, best believe is coming to you. So if you do not address those stuff, if you do not address the system that impacts your morals, then already you are falling prey to a bigger system. It's always going to affect you, whether you're, again, go back to the depression, go back... You could go to school and the teacher teach, um, treats you differently. You don't have a problem. You don't need to have a problem with the teacher. It's affecting the morals. The police that are shooting black men. They, that's based on how they feel that day. They wake up, they're angry at their wives, and then they take you back on a black man's life. That affects everybody. It's the system in which she was raised, and that system does affect their individual lives. So do not think of it as one is... Um, one is um, exclusive. One cannot exist without the other. But the world is complex and all of them are existing at the same time. Thank you. So we have time just for one more question. We do have to end at 1.30. SGAG. Question from Steve. It's kind of a question, maybe more of a suggestion. It, it's clear to me that, and it was clear when I walked in, but now it's even more clear that a lot of the objection to critical race theory is based on a complete misunderstanding of what it is and a lack of understanding of what it isn't. Has this group ever considered trying to invite, uh, because the, the knowledge base here is incredible, and has this group ever considered trying to invite the sponsors of the Utah bill to have a discussion so that they can be educated or the governor himself or the governor chief of staff, anybody, so that there could be the education, because right now it appears that these statutes are being being passed based on what somebody read on a website that's not at all accurate in terms of representing what critical race theory actually is. And more importantly, what it's not. Yeah. So it's funny, as I was sitting here listening to my colleagues talk and then now hearing all the lovely discussion that's coming from the audience. And I'm looking through the, the website of the American Heritage Foundation. And I was gonna make a joke like, if you wanna learn more about CRT, go there. They actually suggest some really great resources to learn about CRT. And I actually wanna take back my comment that, that they don't know. Maybe folks that we're interviewing don't know. I think the more insidious problem is that they do know and they're real scared about what CRT education, what anti-racist education, what ethnic studies education, how that empowers us and students and and they're fucking scared. That's what and I actually, so actually want to take back my comment. I think they know that well, I chuckled when there was like, it's about radicalizing students in the classroom. How are you radicalizing students in the classroom? We got police killing young black and brown men for being black and brown. That is not okay. If I need to get angry and radicalize my students against that, then I'm gonna do it. So I actually think they have a good grasp about it. 
um, and they're scared. Um, and second, I think you're right. I think we should invite them. Um, I was saying that we should have invited Natalie Klein and the other folks from, from the coalition. In fact, I made myself a note that I'm gonna email her and ask for a phone call or a, a little face-to-face -face chat outside. Um, so we didn't, we didn't do it for this time, but I, I think we should. Yeah, I think we should. Thank you. Any other comments from the panelists? Okay. I was just gonna say, I know we have a few comments in the chat and we've run out of time. So I'm really appreciative to everybody who attended via Zoom and we'll continue to work on finding ways to make sure that both um, the people who are hybrid and the people who are in person get heard and have a chance to ask those questions in the future. Thank you. So um, there is pizza in the back. Once we are finished, um, God is good. Thank you for whoever donated that pizza. Um, so feel free to get a slice. I don't know what the options are, but once we finish, you all are more than welcome to get a slice. Thank you. Um, last time we made a big poster uh, that said, we defend critical race theory. Uh, if you have time and there's paper and markers, hopefully um, in this or in the in the hall, um, if you want to take a picture, um, send it to uh, BSU, send it to me, send it to any of us, post it online, just saying I support critical race theory. Uh, small actions are very important and people always ask like, what can I do? Well, do this. And then when you put it on Facebook or Instagram, or Twitter or et cetera, this will get likes and will be shared repetitively. Um, so action uh, speaks louder than words, um, but words are important. So thank you so much. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to my friends. Special shout out and thanks to Russ and Mike DeLuca for helping us on the tech end. We appreciate y'all. Make sure you get some eats.